nice morning. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Graham, you may know me. Um, generally do a lockdown quiz, but uh, we've kind of run out of lockdown, so I've stopped. Um, well, we're going back into lockdown now, so I could do another quiz. If you're interested in a quiz, leave a note in the comments and I'll see what I can do. Uh, this has been quite an interesting year. One of the things I wanted to do this year, which I haven't been able to, is a little bit of history. There's a little history lesson and a few bits and pieces that I wanted to show off during things like the Summer Fate, and I haven't had the chance to. And I think now's a good time. I'm sure, as you all know, behind me is St Peter's Church. It's a fantastic building, originally built in the 11th century, uh, with extensions put on in things like the 13th century and a bit later. I'm going to show you a little something you may not know. So here you have the front door. You go through that to get to services all the time. Behind it, there's another little door there. I'm going to show you what's up there. All right. So let's have a little look in here. Now, it's a bit dark, but that's because it is all like, you know, 13th century. This door it used to be the original door into the church. A uh, classic heavy oak design with, it's absolutely solid, some metal studs for reinforcement going all the way through. That is actually very common in doors of the time. And the reason they exist is quite simple. Churches used to be one of the most defensible places. In the event of any attacks or invasions or anything like that, or even if somebody just wanted whoop, sanctuary, the doors could hold off any attackers. If you attempt to hit a metal reinforced door with a sword or an axe, or even something like a sledgehammer, you will break them a long time before you break the door. So the entire thing is actually defensive and has a lot of use. Right, so as you have probably noticed, this is a very interesting set of spiral stairs, which go quite a long way upwards until we reach this door here. Apologies again for the lack of light. Now, this I'm out of breath now, is the ringing chamber. So starting up, you've got four windows facing north, south, east, west, all the cardinal directions. And right above your heads, we have got six ropes. Each of them are attached to a bell situated in the loft. Oh, the bells themselves, sorry, um, vary in weight from about 300 weight up to about 500 weight. That's basically a quarter of a ton to over half a ton, made of a bronze alloy, uh, which through the use of one hand, you can swing. There is more to ringing a bell than just that. However, let's go and have a look at them. So the ringing itself, obviously done by the bells, which you can see situated behind me here. Uh, the range in size, this one is the smallest bell of all. Uh, it's called the treble. In any ring of bells, the smallest one is always called the treble. And then they stretch all the way around in a clockwise formation so you get to that one at the back there, which is called the tenor. There's only six, but the deepest bell is always called the tenor. These are what are called a fabulous ring, which isn't as bad as it sounds. It means that all of the notes are quite pure. There's no sort of like semitones or harmonies that sound a little bit off. So they're actually really good bells to ring. Uh, you got, as you'll notice, they're all hanging downwards. And that is um, quite customary for things like European ringing, where to get the bell to ring it is just a case of pulling the ropes down below and making them swing back and forth until the clapper underneath smacks into the bell. But we're British, so we do things slightly more awkwardly. The first thing we have to do is make those bells stand upwards. So, some of you are probably wondering how you set a bell upside down so you can ring it. The answer is very simple. Science. Um, momentum, mainly. So this bell is the tenor. This one weighs around half a ton, directly above my head. 
held on by a metal pole about that thick. So the first thing to do is you get the valve moving. Rocking it backwards and forwards. Once you build up some speed, you then make the clapper work by standing upwards. Well, I'll take the camera up there in a second to show you, but point of safety tip here, these ropes are now hot. That basically means that if you accidentally pull this, there is half a ton of momentum ready to swing around. So ropes do not hang on the floor and they use a very special knot to tie it up, which is this one. Now the beauty of this knot is it has a slip knot in every direction. You can get caught in any part of this loop if you accidentally pull the rope, it will give you a rope burn, but it will slide off. So as a matter of fact, all ropes which are up mean the bell are up, all the ropes that are hanging down or attached to the ceiling mean that the bells are down. Put safety tip, let's show you the bells. And here we go back again in the bell chamber. As you can see, the uh, stay, kind of down there-ish, uh, is butted up, leaving this bell totally upside down. As I said, one pull of the rope and you'll move the bell in an entire 360 degree circle. Uh, I'm just going to go ring them down, get it back to downwards and uh, whew, I'll finish off. Well, I really hope you all enjoy this little tour. If you've got any questions, feel free to stick them down in the comments. Um, it's been a lot of fun. If anyone would like to learn how to ring one of these bells, um, anyone can do it. All I'd say is, ultimately, Give it a try. The, uh, be aware, you should probably be sort of like over the age of 11, just purely because you need, obviously, as you've seen, probably a bit of coordination. Um, and you've got to be tall enough to catch the rope when it's at its highest point. But other than that, anybody can ring a bell. A lot of the reasons people stop ringing a bell is just because they can't make it up the stairs. Uh, so enjoy the rest of your day. Hang on a minute. There is one piece I haven't shown you. Because once you get to the top of the bell tower, There's this door right here, and this leads out here. This is the very top of the spire. Uh, up here we've got the flagpole and something else definitely worth looking at. So starting in front of the entryway, we have got, this is the graveyard. Uh, in between those trees there, that's the um, memorial. Uh, we are actually at the highest point in Brandon. Uh, um, when I say in Brandon, that is because, as you notice, the hills go upwards there. That heads uh, towards Centre Parks and Bury St Edmunds. Oh, nice little nod to Tesco there, hello. Um, yeah, so in Brandon, we are at the highest point currently. And as we come around here, there's probably several people watching this going, oh, I can see my house from here. Uh, the beautiful sunrise. Oh, there's completely blowing out all my uh, colour, so. Just do that for a second, there you go. So, yep, uh, this is going across the uh, road to Lake and Heath, which stretches off over in this direction. I think I'm okay now. So 
So over there you have uh, IES, uh, Crown Street, that sort of area. And as we come around here, there was something very interesting to note. Here is the manor house. And we can see it, despite it being surrounded by trees. That is because of an ancient bylaw, which said that at all times, the manor house must have the ability to see the church. And it's still in play today. So that is why there is always a clearer line of sight between the church and the manor house. So we carry on right the way over. Got the uh, brand of riding academy down there. Just across to the sports centre, and that takes us back to where we started. And of course, the roof is absolutely nothing to look at. But we do have a flag. <laughs> 